today on Path of Grace. Listen again to what Paul said. We do not lose heart. Even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. He goes on and says, for our light affliction, (laughs) Paul called his affliction light. He was beaten. He went through all sorts of horrible things. He was stoned and left for dead. He says it's light affliction. Our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. He says it's suffering. It's light and temporary. And somehow, I don't understand it, but it is working for us a far more exceeding weight of glory. It's working something glorious that we can't even begin to understand. I read these words of Paul and I go, I don't know what this means, but I know Paul is letting us know that one day we'll understand it's all been worth it. We'll be able to look back at all that we've gone through, all that we've experienced, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And we'll say, God, Father, you had a purpose in it. We need to remind each other of this. We need to encourage one another with with this hope that Paul shares with us. I remind myself of this every day as I see my dad's body withering away, as I watch him taking his breathing treatments, as I see him forcing himself to eat. Last week, he had dropped down to 118 pounds. He's back up to 120 by the grace of God. Paul says we do not lose heart. Even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. Our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Today, as we continue our study of the book of Daniel, we are moving into Daniel chapter 3, which is, to me, a very exciting chapter. Now, before we start, I want to remind you of what we saw in chapter 2. You remember that King Nebuchadnezzar had a dream that stole away his sleep. It really freaked him out. In this dream, he saw a giant statue, an image with a head of gold, arms and chest made out of silver, belly and thighs of bronze, legs of iron, and feet and toes made out of a mixture of iron and clay. And then in that dream, a rock not cut by human hands came and smashed the entire statue to bits, and then it blew away like dust in the wind. And God gave Daniel the interpretation of the dream, and in a nutshell, it was basically this. Earthly kingdoms come, and they crash. They come, and they go. But eventually, God's kingdom is going to come, and all of the kingdoms of man will be done away with. Now, think about what King Nebuchadnezzar must have thought about that. Because the message for him was this, King, you and your kingdom, represented by this head of gold, you and your kingdom, it's going to go. It's going to crash. King you are on the way out. Now, as we come to chapter 3, some time has passed, and King Nebuchadnezzar decides to build a statue that I believe was kind of inspired by the dream. However, unlike the statue in the dream, he decides to make the entire thing out of gold. Now, remember, in the dream, only the head of the statue, which represented King Nebuchadnezzar and his kingdom, only the head was made out of gold. The head was the only golden part of the statue, but the king decides to make this ginormous statue completely out of gold. Do you think he might have been trying to make a statement? I think so. I believe he was saying, you know what? Despite what Daniel may have said, my kingdom is never going to end. Despite what the God of Daniel may have said, you know what? This is going to go And it's not going to stop. There is no way my kingdom is ever going to crash. Now, as we think about the world we live in, it is kind of hard to imagine the kingdoms of man coming to an end and people struggle and fight to maintain little personal kingdoms or national kingdoms. But one day, God's kingdom will come. Things are not going to continue endlessly in the same cycle that's been going on throughout history. Eventually, everything is going to change. And our hope is not in humanity, but we do have hope for humanity because of what Father's ultimate plans are and what he has done for us through Christ Jesus. Now, let's go ahead and jump into Daniel chapter 3. 
verse 1, I am going to read from Young's literal translation, which is not the easiest reading. However, I love to use it because there are certain words which it translates much more accurately than the other English translations do. Words that play a key part in really our understanding of God's grand design, God's plans for everything. So if you've been wondering why I like to use Young's literal translation, that's why. Daniel chapter 3, verse 1, Nebuchadnezzar, the king hath made an image of gold, its height 60 cubits, its breadth 6 cubits. He hath raised it up in the valley of Dura in the province of Babylon, which is modern-day Iraq. Now let's pause there. Something that I think is significant in verse 1 is the size of this statue. Its height was 60 cubits and breadth was 6 cubits. So we have 60 and Six. Now, in the Bible, numbers are significant. The number seven is the number of the Lord. Seven represents completion or perfection. Now, the number six is obviously less than seven, right? So, think about it this way. It's less than perfect. The number six is considered to be the number for man or mankind. The number seven, again, represents perfection or completion. But the number of mankind is less. It doesn't reach that perfection. The kingdoms of man are less than perfect. And that should be obvious to all of us. Watch the news, look around the world, study history. Now, in the book of Revelation, we come across a guy who is commonly called the Antichrist, who I believe will literally come on the scene. I don't believe he's simply a figurative character. I believe he is real. And the Bible says that he has a number. 666, the number of man. It's about man, 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 the epitome of the striving of man. And I think what we see here in Daniel is a type of, or a bit of a preview of the Antichrist and a little bit of what King Nebuchadnezzar does. During the Great Tribulation period, the Antichrist will build an image and then demand that that image be bowed down to and worshiped. And anyone who will not bow before it is going to be put to death. And here in Daniel chapter 3, we have King Nebuchadnezzar, a man with his statue 60 by 6, and he commands the same thing. Let's take a look, starting in verse 2. And Nebuchadnezzar the king hath sent to gather the satraps, the prefects, and the governors, the honorable judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the province to come to the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king hath raised up. Then are gathered the satraps, the prefects, and the governors, the honorable judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the province to the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king hath raised up. And they are standing before the image that Nebuchadnezzar hath raised up. And a crier is calling mightily. To you they are saying, O peoples, nations, and languages, at the time that ye hear the voice of the cornet, the flute, the harp, the sackbut, the psaltery, the symphony, and all kinds of music, ye fall down and do worship to the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king hath raised up. And whoso doth not fall down and worship, in that hour he is cast into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. So here's this king, the ruler of the world at that time. He builds this golden statue, this image, representing himself and his kingdom. And he says, okay, guys, we're going to have a big get-together. We're going to have a band play, this special music. And when the music starts, everyone is going to bow down and worship the statue. And whoever doesn't is going to be burned alive in a fiery furnace. Wow, that sounds almost like the altar calls I've heard at some religious gatherings. But now might not be the time to talk about that. Anyway, imagine having the type of boss who sends out a memo for a mandatory meeting to let you know that you are required to attend a banquet and buy the boss a gift and that you are to present the boss with the Employer of the Year Award, and if you don't, you'll be fired. That's kind of what King Neb was like, only amplified a billion times. Ego trip? Yeah. Insecurity? I think so. And for the Israelites who had been taken into captivity... The things he was doing was going to create a major issue for them. Remember, the Israelites had been given the law of Moses. They were to have no other gods but the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They were not to bow down before any graven images. They weren't to bow down before statues like this. So 
they're going to face a dilemma. What's going to happen? Take a look at verse 7. Therefore, at that time, when all the peoples are hearing the voice of the cornet, the flute, the harp, the sackbut, the psaltery, and all kinds of music, falling down are all the peoples, nations, and languages, worshiping the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king hath raised up. Therefore, at that time, drawn near, have certain Chaldeans, and accuse the Jews. They have answered, Yea, they are saying to Nebuchadnezzar the king, O king, to the ages live. Thou, O king, hast made a decree that every man who doth hear the voice of the cornet, the flute, the harp, the sackbut, the psaltery, and the symphony, and all kinds of music, doth fall down and worship the golden image. And whoso doth not fall down and worship is cast into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. There are certain Jews whom thou hast appointed over the work of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men have not made of thee, O king, any regard. Thy gods they are not serving, and to the golden image thou hast raised up are not worshiping. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in anger and fury, hath said to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Then these men have been brought in before the king. Nebuchadnezzar hath answered and said to them, is it a laid plan, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? My gods, ye are not serving, and to the golden image that I have raised up, ye are not worshiping? Now, lo, ye are ready, so that at the time that ye hear the voice of the cornet, the flute, the harp, the sackbut, the psaltery, and the symphony, and all kinds of music, ye fall down. Hmm. He's saying, you guys better fall down, and you better worship this image that I have made. And if you don't, in that hour, ye are cast into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. Who is that God who doth deliver you out of my hands? Wow, don't go on to verse 16. Put yourself in their sandals. Picture this king. He's got all his henchmen around him. He's wearing his kingly garb. Everyone else in this ginormous crowd has bowed down. People you know are in the crowd bowing down. Maybe you've got relatives in the crowd bowing down. Maybe some of them have been telling you, come on, just vow. Don't you realize what it's going to cost you if you don't? And maybe that's when you start to rationalize a bit. I can just kind of nod. I don't have to really mean it. Not a big deal. Just a little nod, kind of a pseudo bow, not a real bow, just a little bow. I guess I could bend down and tie my shoe. That way they'll think I'm bowing, but I'm not really bowing. You look at your two buddies. They look at you. Your hands are getting all sweaty. Maybe you're shaky. And you say, no way. I'm not going to do it. And suddenly the king calls you to come forward. You're standing in front of him. Everyone is quiet. And the king says, everyone's watching right now. My reputation is on the line. I'm not going to let this slide. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'll give you one more chance, though. But if you do not bow this time into the fire, you are going. Now, what would you do? Can you imagine how their hearts must have been racing? Look at verse 16. Let's see what happens. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego have answered, Yea, they are saying to the king Nebuchadnezzar, We have no need concerning this matter to answer thee. Lo, it is our God whom we are serving. He's able to deliver us from a burning fiery furnace and from thy hand. O king, he doth deliver. And lo, not, in other words, but if not, be it known to thee, O king, that thy gods we are not serving, and to the golden image thou hast raised up, we're not going to bow down in front of it. We're not going to worship. Now, are these guys bold and brave and amazing or what? They're pretty exceptional, aren't they? King, our God can deliver us from this furnace, and he is going to deliver us from your hand. But even if he lets us die in that fire, we would rather do that than bow down before your dirty, rotten, stinking idol. I added the dirty, rotten, stinking part. Now, I believe that they understood, they knew, they realized that death would not be the end. They had the resurrection to look forward to. So no matter what were to happen, they knew the king didn't own them. He didn't ultimately hold their fate in his hands. He might have the ability to have them killed, but that would be temporary. Now, my friend, in this life, you and I are going to face trials and hardship and maybe even fiery furnaces. And God can deliver us from them. If you know how this story ends, you know that God does something miraculous for these guys. And God could do that for you and me, too. But 
God doesn't always deliver in the way we see in the book of Daniel. He doesn't always deliver us from the suffering the way we would hope he would. But ultimately, we will be delivered from it. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, Paul is writing, and believe me, Paul was a guy who had faced some trials and persecution. He was ultimately executed. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 16 and 17, he says this. He says, we do not lose heart. Even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. I think Shack, Rack, and Benny understood what Paul was talking about. In light of eternity, any hardship, any persecution, any pain, it's just for a moment. It's very, very temporary. Just like the greatest things, the greatest pleasures this world has to offer, the kingdoms of man are only temporary and fleeting. It's the same way with our hardship and and the pain, whether it's the pain of some physical problem, the pain of sorrow and grief, the pain of a broken and fractured relationship, or even the pain of persecution. Paul goes on in verse 18 of that chapter, and he says, While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are those are eternal. For we know that if our earthly house, this tent, our body is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. He's letting us know that everything we are currently experiencing, including the pain, the hardship, the difficulty, it's fleeting. It's temporary. Aren't you glad? Last night I was at the ICU in a hospital in Tucson, very late last night. My aunt is still there. Things are not looking good at all. Her name is Mary. Please pray for her and the rest of the family. Wasn't able to talk to my Aunt Mary because she's unconscious. I spent several hours talking with her daughter, my, my precious cousin Kelly. And Kelly, oh my goodness, she has gone through so many physical problems uh, beginning at a young age, she's had several strokes, all sorts of devastating things that have been going on for so long. She's now, I, I believe, 48 years old, just a few years older than me. And as we stood there holding her mom's hands, we talked about all the pain and suffering and that somehow, ultimately, in the economy of God, we'll eventually be able to look back and understand and see that in all cases, for us, Romans 8.28 has been true, even though in the midst of it, it's hard to understand how any of it can really be for the good. Because it hurts so bad while we're in it. We talked about the whole idea of contrast and how intellectually it's easy for us to understand that we, we can't grasp the idea of light without darkness, good tasty food without tasting bad food, and how we wouldn't really understand the preciousness of life without the reality of death. That God is teaching us and growing us and, and using everything going on to shape us and prepare us to absolutely be able to enjoy and relish what is ultimately in store. But yet, even trying to have that perspective to live with it, it doesn't ease the pain. Life still hurts. And my cousin Kelly, she said, I'm ready to graduate from this. I think I've learned enough about suffering. And you know what? I think most of us have. From the human perspective, I'm saying, okay, God, it's time to graduate. Can't we move on? It seems like this is going on and on and on and on. But listen again to what Paul said. We do not lose heart. Even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. Aren't we being renewed even by talking about these things and sharing scripture, encouraging one another? He goes on and says, for our light affliction, <laughs> Paul called his affliction light he was beaten. He went through all sorts of horrible things. He was stoned and left for dead. He says it's light affliction. Our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. 
it says is suffering. It's light and temporary. And somehow, I don't understand it, but it is working for us a far more exceeding weight of glory. It's working something glorious that we can't even begin to understand. I read these words of Paul and I go, I don't know what this means, but I know Paul is letting us know that one day we'll understand it's all been worth it. We'll be able to look back at all that we've gone through, all that we've experienced, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And we'll say, God, Father, you had a purpose in it. We need to remind each other of this. We need to encourage one another with, with this hope that Paul shares with us. I remind myself of this every day as I see my dad's body withering away, as I watch him taking his breathing treatments, as I see him forcing himself to eat. Last week, he had dropped down to 118 pounds. He's back up to 120 by the grace of God. Paul says we do not lose heart. Even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. Our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Now, let's get back to Daniel chapter 3. Kind of a long rabbit trail, I know. Verse 19. The Nebuchadnezzar hath been full of fury, and the expression of his face hath been changed concerning Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He answered and said, To heat the furnace seven times above that which it is seen to be heated. And to certain mighty men who are in his force, he hath said to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, to cast them into the burning, fiery furnace. Then these men have been bound in their coats, their tunics, and their turbans, and their clothing, and have been cast into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. Therefore, because that the word of the king is urgent, and the furnace heated exceedingly, those men who have taken up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, killed them hath the spark of the fire. In other words, this fire was so hot, the guys that had tied them up and thrown Shack, Rack, and Benny into the fire, they themselves were burned up by it. Verse 23, And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, have fallen down in the midst of the burning fiery furnace, bound. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king hath been astonished, and hath risen in haste. He hath answered and said to his counselors, have we not cast three men into the midst of the fire bound? They have answered and are saying to the king, Certainly, O king. He answered and hath said, Lo, I am seeing four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt. And the appearance of the fourth is like to a son of the gods. Wow. They find themselves in the fire. But in the midst of it, the king says, look, there's a fourth guy there. One that looks like the son of God or literally a son of the gods. He knew that one of them in that fire wasn't just some regular dude. He knew they hadn't thrown that fourth guy in there. Something made him very much stand out and in the fire. These three guys had an encounter that was beyond anything they would have ever experienced if they had not gone through that frightening time in that furnace. In the fire is where they were met by the Lord in a special way. In the fire. Verse 26. Then Nebuchadnezzar hath drawn near to the gate of the burning fiery furnace. He hath answered and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of God most high, come forth, ye come. Then come forth to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego from the midst of the fire and gathered together the satraps, the prefects and the governors and the counselors of the king, seeing these men that the fire hath no power over their bodies, and the hair of their head hath not been singed, and their coats have not changed, and the smell of fire hath not passed on them. They didn't even smell like smoke. Their hair wasn't singed. The only thing that burned, the only thing that burned was the binding ropes that the world had placed on them, the ropes placed on them by this earthly king, by this kingdom of man, the ropes of a false religious idolatrous system. Those things burned away in the fire. The time in the fire was temporary, and it did something good. Hmm. Scripture tells us that our God is a consuming fire. Paul talks about some being saved 
as though through the fire. Hmm. Maybe that's for another study as well. Verse 28, let's keep moving. Nebuchadnezzar hath answered and hath said, Blessed is the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who hath sent his messenger, and hath delivered his servants, who trusted on him. And the word of the king changed, and gave up their bodies, that they might not serve nor do worship to any god except to their own god. And by me a decree is made, that any people, nation, and language that doth speak erroneously concerning the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, pieces he is made, and its house is made a dunghill, because that there is no other God who is able thus to deliver. Then the king hath caused Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to prosper in the province of Babylon. And I guess that's where we ought to wrap up. We've been going quite a while. Next time we get together, we'll move into chapter 4. My name is James Flanders. Thank you so much for listening. As always, thank you for your prayers. I need them each day. Thank you for your encouraging words. They mean so much. And thank you to those few who have been helping support this ministry financially. Your help is so appreciated and very much needed. And thank you for all of the rest of you prayerfully considering supporting me in the future with this audio ministry. Be blessed, my friends. Be blessed.